السلام علیکم خواتین و حضرات وسیم احسن ویلکمس یو ٹو دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان وی آر پروسیڈنگ ٹو ورڈ لیکچر نمبر تھرٹی آف ورک دا برانڈ مینجمنٹ ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو فور دی ٹاپک آف ڈسکشن اسٹل ریمینس چینل سسٹمس آئی واز ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ ہاؤ اے گڈ چینل سسٹم ود بلس آف ویلیو فار دا کمپنی ایز ویل ایز فار دا کسٹمر ٹو ورڈ دا اینڈ آف دا پریویس لیکچر And I'm going to start my lecture with uh, the remaining parts of uh, the same concept that I was talking about in the previous lecture. Good channel systems build up value through product quality. The meaning systems they make sure that uh, the product is delivered to the customer in the quality which was envisaged by the manufacturer. And also the inventory management systems which support the availability of the product in its best possible quality form are also part of uh, the channel management systems which ensure good value for the company and also for the customer. And then we talked about um, the importance of training and uh, knowledge which are imparted to the customers in order to make sure that they do understand very well how to use the product and the, what really are the functions in their optimal form. And uh, I also talked about uh, the product availability in uh, its total assortments, okay, the meaning the good channel system has got to make sure that uh, your brand is available in the market okay, the by all uh, formats, okay, the by differentiation through ingredients, okay, the by extension okay, through flavors, uh, tastes, and so on and so forth. And I also talked about the importance of a uh, good channel system uh, serving the customers uh, through offering a uh, very good service. Service in the form of transaction services, with the meaning while the transaction is taking place, and services in the form of after-sale service. Um, the value build-up does not end there. Those were a few of um, the, uh, the factors that I talked about. And the remaining ones I'm going to talk right now. A good channel system could also could build up value through image. So in other words, a good channel system could build up image of the brand and also of the company. It is the responsibility of the management to develop the kind of a system which is compatible with the associations which you want developed on part of the customer and uh, the A system which also is compatible with the brand's persona which you develop. And it goes without saying that um, associations which you want uh, evoked in the minds of the customers uh, are a part of the brand's persona. And you will also recall that brand's persona deals with all those characteristics of the brand uh, which could be translated into kind of human form or human characteristics like a brand is reliable, a brand is durable, a brand is uh, fashionable, a brand is expensive, it carries an appeal of richness, um, a brand is average, so on and so forth. So it is the um, responsibility of the management to develop uh, a, a channel system which is compatible with all these factors. Uh, to give you examples, let's take a look at uh, luggage Luggage is available uh, in almost all good supermarkets. But then at the same time, if you're dealing in uh, a brand which is very exclusive, you may not like to sell your brand through uh, any uh, retail outlets. You may like to go for very specialized stores. And uh, if you're not really happy and satisfied with that, you might like to go for stores which are owned by the company so that uh, you can uh, already develop the right uh, most associations and um, you really can uh, uh, create an ambience which is very compatible with uh, uh, the positioning of the brand. Examples could also be given in the case of uh, the watches, for example, fashionable watches, uh, the mountain bikes, for example. The mountain bikes, which are very much in vogue nowadays, they may not be available at every store that sells bicycles. Example can also be given in the area of uh, FMCGs. If you are selling a product which is very much differentiated 
and it is extended by some very special ingredients, something for diabetics, for example, uh, you may like to go for uh, the channel which is very compatible with that. So the lesson here is that uh, the good channel system is always very compatible with the nature and the character of the product and the associations and the brand's persona which you are trying to develop because otherwise there's going to be conflict and uh, the right kinds of associations, the image and uh, the, the, the personality of the brand it may not be developed the way you want. Another area uh, where um, a good channel system builds up the value for the company is um, cost efficiency. And that's something you know, that I've been talking about uh, every now and then. Uh, but here, uh, in a very special context, uh, what we have to keep in mind is that um, the more you sell, the lesser are the costs. And it is the responsibility of the management to see to it that uh, your system is very cost efficient. In other words, you end up selling high volumes or a desirable level of volumes which are part of your objectives. And you know why those objectives were set and um, the numbers that you're wanting to achieve, so on and so forth. This is where the concept of... Uh, uh, the optimization comes in and optimization in terms of distribution. When you are distributing your products, you cover a certain geographic area, meaning a certain part of the city. No matter what, that part of the city or that part of the market has got to be covered. Now, if you cover the 100 stores as against 50 stores, your cost automatically will go down. So this is how you optimize your distribution by extending your coverage or by intensifying your coverage within the area. So the more you sell, the lesser are the costs and the more efficient is the system, the more profitable is the business. So it is the responsibility of the management to develop channels which are cost efficient and at the same time deliver all possible benefits to customers. This is uh, all about the value with the build up with the, with the help of um, a good channel system. Now the next topic which I really want to uh, cover is relates power. You know, you'll be astonished because why I'm talking about power. Power is something which really is uh, talked about all the managers and all the business people who are involved in one particular line of business. Who controls the channel is a question that attracts everyone's attention among all members of the channel. You must have heard that um, company XYZ is so strong that whatever it introduces, the people in the market are always more than pleased to go to the company and seek distribution because they know that the selling product of that particular manufacturer is going to bring them profitability. So that is the role of uh, the power uh, which really attracts those people toward that business. You must also have heard about uh, the companies uh, going to very strong distributors, uh, making uh, sure that uh, their brands are distributed by uh, famous distributors in order to make sure that uh, the customer reach is optimal and uh, the product is available at um, the locations of customers' preference. So the companies do talk with good parties, which you can have you know, a very good reputation in the marketplace. So from that point of view, those parties carry power. Basically, it is the ability of the brand to offer value to customers that drives power all along the channel. So in other words, it basically is the brand power which makes manufacturers that are so powerful and so important and so attractive for members of the channel. It again is the power of the brands that make you know, certain distributors or distribution houses uh, that much powerful that uh, most of the businesses would like to grow them talking about uh, developing a relationship in terms of distributing their products. It is uh, a two-way process through which uh, the brand accumulates 
out of the power by offering value to customers and by offering opportunities of growth to intermediaries. I'm going to talk about this um, in a few moments, uh, but I think it goes without saying uh, since um, uh, a brand moves through different phases and through different stages of uh, the channel, um, at every stage it changes ownership and uh, the people all along the line invest into it and uh, that is how it develops certain relationships all along the line and that is how it offers power uh, to all of them and that is how it offers uh, the opportunities to all those customers uh, to have value and, and, and build up value. Uh, so it is uh, basically a two-way process and uh, as a result of which you know, we can easily say that uh, mostly it is the brand power which uh, becomes the basis of power on part of uh, the manufacturers, uh, distributors and other intermediaries. All members of the channel could have a certain uh, relationship with the brand like I said earlier and uh, it is the level of this relationship which defines the uh, level of advantage which that particular uh, intermediary carries and um, it is uh, this relationship which also uh, defines the amount of power with which uh, that particular intermediary derives out of that relationship. So we have got to be very careful and very mindful of uh, the level of relationships with which um, our brand has with um, uh, the different uh, the members of the channel uh, so that uh, we know when and how to bring about uh, strategic shifts uh, in our strategies and also in our tactics. Power is something which has got to be dealt with very delicately. If you are a manufacturer and you think you know, your distributors are very powerful, you have to deal with them accordingly and vice versa. So it is the relative degree of power and the relative degree of advantage or advantages uh, which um, come to you uh, because of that power which have got to be taken into consideration uh, before you make any strategic moves or you make any strategic decisions. Um, when I talk about uh, relationships at uh, the different levels and the advantages and the amount of power uh, I think uh, it is obvious that I'm talking about a system which is uh, essentially indirect and uh, which is kind of multi-layered and at every layer you have a function of power and the function of power is defined by you know the brand power and a few other factors which I just talked about. It also uh, means that um, in an indirect system, the power is diluted and it is diluted among so many different members. And I already have uh, talked about uh, power being very relative to the situation and to the relationship, meaning there are some uh, who have uh, more power and there are some who have less power. Let us now define what power really is. I think we are quite very clear about the function of the power plays in the marketplace and uh, we uh, must be having a lot of questions flashing into our minds uh, about um, the role, uh, the level of power plays in the market in the context of distribution channels. Power is um, defined by social scientists as the ability to have others do something that otherwise would not be done. In other words, the ability to cause a change. Now, what is this change? And let us talk about this change in the context of power relating to distribution channels. It is the ability of one channel member to influence or alter the behavior or decision of another member. Let me explain this with the help of an example. A manufacturer may influence retailers um, to gain the prime locations within their stores for uh, its products. And if the manufacturer succeeds in gaining those prime locations, power is exercised. I think it is understandable. 
But then at the same time, Gita is, is something very interdependent, with the meaning all the members depend on each other. And it is because of that interdependence that uh, the power is never absolute. It is relative. And like I said, some have the more of it and some have less of it. For a new manufacturer, just to give you an example, distributors and retailers may pose challenging demands, um, thus exercising their power toward the pricing strategy. What does this mean? You are a new manufacturer, for example, and you are introducing a new brand and you're dealing with uh, the members who really are very powerful. Even if they're not very powerful, they are powerful um, given your situation because you need their help and uh, you need their power uh, to uh, make your brand uh, successful. And uh, they might, you know, turn around and tell you, well, we would like to have more margins. And you find yourself kind of helpless and you agree to that. When that happens, your pricing strategy gets changed. How? In two different ways. One is, you may have to go for price increase. I mean, an increase over what you had envisaged. Because you think if you do not go for this price increase, you just cannot afford to pass on the kind of um, margins which uh, these members are uh, wanting. The other way to go about it is that uh, you do something with uh, the margins uh, by not changing the price. And you do that at your own cost. If you increase the margins of uh, the members of the channel uh, that, that are very demanding, you cut into your own with the margins, which means less profitability. So. These are the kind of implications which uh, are caused in the marketplace because of the function of power. And therefore, uh, you've got to be very sensitive to the relationship which you and your brand has with different intermediaries in terms of the level uh, of power they have. The more powerful someone is, um, the less powerful someone else's. It is kind of an inverse relationship. Uh, it does happen at times that uh, the manufacturer and the manufacturer's distributors uh, both happen to be very powerful. And uh, in that particular situation, again, it is a question of uh, relativeness. You know, you have to be sensitive to the uh, level of dependence uh, on each other, whether you are working for the manufacturer or you're working for the distributor. Or for that matter, you're working for an important major retailer. The question that uh, arises here is, what is the source of power? Well, the prime source in most of the cases is the brand itself, and that is what I have talked about. Power also comes to you because of your reputation, the meaning good reputation, and because of uh, an established relationship with uh, the other members of the channel over years and years and maybe decades. Let us take a look at uh, the different sources uh, which uh, uh, offer um, a certain level of power to the different members of the channel. Uh, the first one is uh, rewards. Uh, what is rewards power? Well, rewards power is uh, one member's ability to give another something of value. To explain this with uh, the help of an example, a retailer offering shelf space and point of sale support of value the to a manufacturer and the manufacturer in return offering in you know, a good pricing uh, maybe better margins uh, some promotion support and uh, a little bit of advertising and uh, extended payment terms for example so what is happening is that power is being exercised at two different ends and that is the beauty of the relationship and that is the beauty of the system uh, because it is working to the mutual benefit of both the parties one of the, uh, the important uh, the objectives of uh, the understanding power and then uh, the making your uh, the tactical moves and also your strategic moves or shifts uh, is a complete understanding, like I said earlier, of the level of power so that you should not go wrong in making mistakes, meaning in making bad decisions. I mean, you shouldn't go wrong in making good decisions and uh, because that leads to bad decisions. Um, 
if two different parties uh, they keep on offering um, incentives to each other, uh, meaning uh, they keep on offering uh, rewards power to each other, they uh, fortify their relationship. And uh, that uh, brings in a lot of credibility uh, within the relationship. And that is something in which is long lasting. And uh, like I said, that is something which is good for the system. And uh, it becomes something which uh, is shared uh, not only by those two parties, uh, but by example, uh, that can be extended to the other members also. The other uh, the source of power is uh, coercion. Now, let me tell you, this is not a good source, but it is there. And uh, the coercive power, which basically means uh, the compelling by force. I mean, that's, that's what coercion is. The coercive power is exercised when one member has the ability to control resources and the change behavior of the other party. I think it goes without saying it is not a good source of power, but then it is there, like I said. And uh, this can be explained with the help of an example where you are, uh, again, a new manufacturer and you are powerless in a way. And uh, you are told that uh, you have to agree to the terms and conditions which other members want. Otherwise, uh, you're out of the game. And uh, that's coercion. Um, that's the example could be given vice versa. A very strong manufacturer uh, can uh, withhold certain resources which could be very productive or which could be translated in terms of rewards if they were given in a very positive way. So the withholding of those rewards is the coercive power. Uh, and let me tell you that uh, the coercive power is uh, something which uh, brings in conflict uh, within the channel. And uh, channel conflict is uh, not good for uh, the channel members, even for the member who is being coercive. Because the time is going to come when the other party which is being coerced um, is going to look for alternatives and uh, once the party uh, realizes that the level of dependence on uh, the other party, uh, meaning the, uh, the party that is coercing uh, uh, has lessened, uh, the party is uh, going to uh, break the relationship with um, the other one. So that is the negative side of um, the coercive power and it is something which is very uh, exploitative. And uh, in other words, it, it should not be exercised because there's a natural tendency on part of others to resist it. Another uh, the source of power, which is a beautiful source, I must uh, tell you that, and that is something you must work for any company you are working for or you are a part of, and that is legitimate power. Legitimate power is based on the belief that uh, the one party has the right or one party is entitled to ask for a certain behavior owing to its reputation, owing to its position in the market, and owing to the role it plays in the market. Such beliefs are held about those manufacturers who are involved uh, in the production of uh, the very high quality products and uh, those manufacturers uh, who are involved um, in a lot of uh, research and development, for example, and uh, the manufacturers uh, who produce goods that really uh, surpass customers' expectations. I think it is natural that uh, the members of the channel uh, who get influenced uh, by the, uh, the reputation and uh, by the behavior and by the role uh, that that kind of manufacturer plays in the market, um, that uh, they grant that manufacturer uh, status of power. So uh, it is something very legitimate. But then you see, in order for um, uh, that kind of power uh, to be granted uh, to someone, you've got to uh, be a little traditional uh, in terms of your uh, value systems. Uh, because unless uh, you have you know, those kinds of values uh, that you respect somebody uh, who is uh, contributing uh, toward development of something uh, so beneficial uh, for the whole market and for the customers, consumers, for everyone, that you grant that status, a status to that party. So it is a function of uh, the value systems on part of uh, uh, the different members of the, of the whole community that uh, is willing to grant that status.
Another source of power is uh, what is called expert power. Expert power stems from um, superior knowledge and information uh, on part of one party. And that party, in most of the cases, is the manufacturer. Because a manufacturer who's been involved into R&D and uh, who knows um, very succinctly why uh, that product has been brought into being uh, certainly has the better knowledge than the one who's going to use that or the one who's going to buy that as an intermediary. To explain this concept with the help of an example, um, let me talk about the sales force which is out in the market uh, training uh, the distributors and retailers about uh, you know promotional techniques, uh, latest marketing trends, about uh, the inventory management, just to cite a few. And uh, on the basis of those, what happens is the performance of those distributors and retailers improves. Uh, when that happens, they become more receptive and uh, they are more influenced by the power you have. And uh, the equation between uh, the two parties get kind of uh, further uh, fine-tuned. When you give training to a retailer, the chances are the retailer is going to offer you with a better space um, and uh, the outlet. Uh, when you train somebody with regard to inventory management, the chances are that uh, the ordering system is going to improve and uh, that is going to improve to the benefit of all the parties and you as manufacturer in particular. So what happens is the company wields power. Um, in most of the cases, we can summarize um, the, uh, the whole discussion like this, that in most of the cases, power um, results from uh, a combination of different factors. Uh, for example, a company can have legitimate power and at the same time, get expert power. I think when a company has legitimate power, expert power becomes kind of an extension of that legitimate power um, in most of the cases, if not in all. Uh, by the same token, that if a company you know, has uh, rewards power, uh, the company can wield um, expert power or legitimate power somewhere along the line you know, by its you know, behavior, you know, by the role it plays in the marketplace. So you know, we can summarize it like this, that you know, there is a combination of different factors you know, which um, gives different um, you know, members of the channel a certain level of power in the marketplace. but what uh, is generally seen in the marketplace is that um, brand acceptance and store acceptance are on top of the list when it comes to the factors that really give you power. So brand acceptance and store acceptance, two of the very important um, elements uh, which automatically translates into power for the manufacturer because uh, he's the one or she's the one uh, who produces uh, that brand and store acceptance translates into retailers. So we are now going to look at uh, the, the power uh, wielded by retailers and manufacturers and then see how these two and the others uh, in the marketplace, of course distributors and wholesalers, should respond to uh, different levels of power in order to be effective not only for themselves, but uh, for all the members of the channel. Because let me uh, explain this and let me express myself very uh, comprehensively that uh, the objective of a good channel system is profitability on part of all the members. Because if you cut the one out, uh, well, you are undermining uh, the whole system. So a good system is the one which is uh, beneficial and which is profitable for all the members. Okay, so back to uh, the uh, retailer power and uh, the manufacturer power. Um, let's talk about uh, the manufacturers first. Um, it is uh, very obvious for uh, the people like us in the buy now that uh, a multi-brand company or um, a mega brand corporation is in a, in a better position to have uh, a lot of power and uh, uh, this kind of a company deals with uh, the distributors and retailers from a position of strength. How that company deals with um, other members of the channel 
is that company's choice. The meaning whether the company deals arrogantly in a coercive way or the company ends up giving some rewards, gaining something in return is that company's choice. Uh, but uh, in most of the cases in the present day's world, the companies are very prudent and they are very pragmatic in uh, dealing with uh, the other members of the channel. And that is what uh, they make uh, the mega brand, uh, mega brand companies and uh, the multi-brand conglomerates as huge as they are. So the fact remains that uh, the companies that have uh, the huge portfolio of uh, powerful brands uh, the end up wielding uh, more power than others. And companies that have um, a smaller portfolio or companies that are dealing uh, in just about the one or two brands um, have uh, uh, less power. And uh, whatever the level of power and whatever is the size of the one company, they all have got to be very sensitive to the level of power enjoyed by different members of the channel. That is what it boils down to. Let us now talk about uh, the, the power which is being enjoyed by retailers uh, nowadays. I talked about two factors, uh, one being the manufacturers and the other being retailers. So let us now uh, talk about uh, why retailers have become so important and uh, how to deal with um, them given the competitive situation of um, the present day's market. Again, all the businesses have got to be very prudent and pragmatic because of the mutual dependence. And this dependence is highlighted uh, more and more in case of uh, the growing power of retailers. I pointed out this thing in uh, one of my very um, first lectures that um, the balance of power is uh, shifting more towards retailers than manufacturers. Why? Number one, because the final purchasing action takes place at the retail stores. It is that location where the hands are changed and the final touch of the sale is given to the product, meaning your brand, and it gets into the hands of the final consumer. The second factor is that the sector, meaning the retail sector in, in itself, has become very dynamic. It really is like the uplifting itself in appearance, in growth, in size, in innovation, and um, in uh, managerial expertise. You don't really have to go out of the country to see how this sector is really improving. The emergence of chain stores and supermarkets, and also individual retail stores um, is uh, changing the whole landscape of uh, retailing uh, all over the place. Even in uh, the over market, uh, things really have changed very dramatically uh, over the last, I would say, uh, the 15 to 20 years, and more so in the last five years than before. Why? Uh, because uh, the people are getting uh, uh, exposed to the international lifestyle uh, because of their foreign travels. They're getting exposed to um, uh, communications uh, with the help of electronic media, television channels, internet, and so on and so forth. And uh, also they're getting exposed because uh, of uh, uh, their uh, relatives and friends who are living in the developed world. And uh, that... Uh, uh, coupled uh, with uh, the rising standards of living in here in this country, what is happening is we are coming up with better and better uh, retail outlets. So there's a host of factors, uh, like I uh, pointed out, you know, foreign travels and exposure to communication and um, exposure to the way of living in uh, the developed world uh, on part of those you know, who are very close to us and then learning from those people um, uh, coupled with uh, the uh, rising uh, the standards of living, uh, we are coming up with better and better uh, and more and more retail outlets. Uh, the whole uh, the face of uh, retail, uh, retailing uh, is undergoing a tremendous change. So the change is uh, not only qualitative, it also is quantitative. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the factor number two with which I've just talked about in um, relation to this 
factor number one, with which is the changing of hands um, between the retailer and the final consumer that uh, really have uh, shifted uh, the, the balance of power um, toward the retailers. Retailers on um, their part are becoming more and more educated. So the qualitative change which I'm talking about is not taking place only in terms of appearance or size. It also is taking place in terms of uh, with education and training. Um, I was talking about the expert power. because so one factor is that manufacturers are uh, the training these retailers. The other factor is that uh, these retailers are educating themselves. They're going into the information systems. They're putting up the computers uh, all along the um, procurement line and uh, right down to uh, where the final uh, the sale is made and uh, they have a repository of uh, the information which is very expensive and uh, which is very useful not only by the retailers but also uh, by the manufacturers if the retailers are willing to share that information with manufacturers. I mean that is one thing which uh, I can throw some light on and that uh, really relates the area of uh, what you may call the vertical marketing systems in which relationships uh, transcend uh, the, your boundaries, meaning if you happen to be a manufacturer, uh, you get into some kind of relationship with, uh, with major retailers uh, who have uh, the kind of information uh, which I just talked about uh, because they have uh, you know, the beautifully laid out systems and uh, they can provide you with uh, some valuable data on uh, consumer purchases, on uh, consumer behavior, on um, uh, buying patterns, and so on and so forth. And on the basis of that, you can really improve your customer model and then bring about innovations, which is a continuous perpetual process um, in, in, in terms of brand management. So um, it is um, the education uh, and training on part of the retailers, the sophistication which that education and training uh, have brought about, and that gives a lot of power to retailers. And uh, that is something which uh, is adding to the, the concentration of that power. And uh, the, while dealing with uh, the, those kinds of retailers, we've got to be very sensitive, not that, uh, that we wouldn't like to annoy them, because we would like to share something with them which translates into uh, value, meaning profits, the higher level of profitability, a better level of business, and all related things. These uh, retailers uh, are in a better position to measure the uh, sales relationship with uh, shelf space, location in the store, and uh, effects of promotions, etc and provide uh, the detailed and minute data to the manufacturers. So that is uh, the very valuable the information which uh, the manufacturers uh, the must seek. And uh, the going back to the, um, the concept of uh, the vertical marketing systems, that you may also like to get into if you happen to work for a manufacturer or for a retailer, you may like to get into some kind of relationship which is inter-organizational and uh, in which uh, you help each other by providing each other some um, kind of structured information. If you are a manufacturer, uh, you um, can uh, impart uh, the training uh, to uh, retailers, and if you happen to be a retailer, uh, you can offer uh, that particular manufacturer uh, something in return, and nothing could be better than the kind of data uh, which I was talking about. Uh, data relating to shelf space, location in the store, and buying behavior, and buying patterns, and, and so on and so forth. Because this is where you really um, can uh, get pick up uh, get some very get valuable information uh, to be able to improve your customer model, and then see you know, how you really stack up against competition. The question that might flash into your mind, if you are going to get into this kind of a relationship, Others, meaning other major players, can also get into that. But well, yes. Uh, the question again is uh, who uh, gets into that kind of relationship uh, first? And uh, who makes uh, uh, the best of it first? And uh, who is in a better position to keep others away from that kind of relationship? 
they are all as a part of uh, the the marketing battle with which takes place in the fields of marketing and uh, you've got to look into all those uh, strategic things uh, as they come or as you may feel they may come and uh, as you may formulate uh, to be preemptive we've talked about the power uh, which uh, the manufacturers have because of uh, brand acceptance and we also have talked about uh, why there is uh, so much concentration of power um, with retailers um, and that is because of the uh, store acceptance because the people have um, certain preferences to, uh, to go to stores which are close to uh, where they live or uh, which are very fashionable even if they're not very close by so it is the um, two areas of uh, the manufacturers and retailers uh, where we see a, a lot of concentration of power how should these two uh, the entities uh, the operate in the marketplace given that the both are powerful this is a hypothetical question and this also is something which you really are going to um, get into uh, the moment you uh, start working in the practical field well the the best possible solution uh, to deal with uh, the two respective you know the power levels is to um, converge the, your uh, uh, power at a point the, which is good for the brand because whatever power you have as a manufacturer or as a retailer it must be used not to show your muscle it must be used to improve your brand meaning brand's performance you have to make the brand more powerful because uh, the more powerful is the brand the um, higher is the level of profitability for both meaning the manufacturer and the retailer manufacturers are uh, mindful of uh, the fact that uh, the retailers uh, have a lot of power and uh, the off the shift that uh, has taken place uh, in favor of the retailers and they're also very mindful of uh, the point of convergence uh, where uh, the brand must be supported in the meaning of point where uh, the power of the manufacturer and power of the retailer uh, must converge and meet at a point they are mindful of all that but there has been a reaction on part of the manufacturers and reaction has showed itself in the form of retail outlets owned and operated by manufacturers meaning the manufacturers could have opted to go for their own outlets now this may not be the case um, for the FMCGs where you are producing in the one line of uh, uh, the products uh, and um, that may not be very viable in terms of uh, putting up a supermarket but this uh, is quite very viable in terms of uh, many other uh, consumer items consumer durables in particular and uh, electronics uh, for example uh, luggage for example uh, the watches uh, there could be uh, the host of different items could you think of those and uh, that doesn't take a uh, the marketing genius to know uh, what those products could be um, for which you know you have to have your own outlets but just look around yourself could within your own market of Pakistan and you will see that you have some beautiful stores owned by uh, the manufacturers of uh, apparel and um, the manufacturers of shoes for example uh, these are two uh, the very prominent areas in which uh, the manufacturers are operating the very successfully uh, the the fashion apparel or the I mean the garments the which uh, are uh, the casual um, they have uh, uh, their own stores and same is the case with, uh, with the casual shoes and also dress shoes now once you have um, your own outlets because what happens is that uh, the retail brand um, becomes the product brand the meaning the product brand XYZ is also the retail brand and vice versa so there you have a lot of uniformity and that uh, adds to your power uh, because uh, the brand uh, gets double level of strength the channel is not only better controlled it is owned by you so in addition to better profitability and power uh, the management process becomes conflict free offering better opportunities for growth you have one store today you are going to have another one you're going to have another one 
and another one and the process goes on. Retail brand becomes uh, the product brand and uh, uh, again uh, that gives you the double strength because uh, uh, when you are selling your brand through um, a supermarket or a retail outlet not owned by the company, um, it is a very different ball game from the one which is totally owned by you, okay, meaning that you have okay, your brand being sold at a retail outlet which has the same brand name. So that uh, adds um, a new dimension to the, the brand consumer relationship and it defines the whole process all over again. It changes the brand's world altogether. And uh, like I said earlier, you take a look at uh, the, the chain stores of, of the clothing and shoes and uh, you will realize that the whole setup is created with uh, the brand positioning and uh, the brand values, quality propositions in mind. If you are selling your brand through uh, somebody else's uh, store, uh, you are not in a position to go for the kind of decor uh, which is going to support your brand's positioning or your brand's values. Conversely, uh, when you have your own store, uh, you can uh, develop the whole theme uh, the all around the positioning of the brand and you can go for a theme which is a reflection of the values of the brand. If the brand is sturdy, you can go for the theme you know, which is uh, reflected uh, accordingly in terms of uh, the fixtures which you have inside of the store, in terms of the colors which you have inside of the store. And by the same token, you see, if you are selling perfumes and those kind of uh, personal care items under your own brand name, you can go for a decor which is compatible with that line of products. That may not be the case with somebody else's store. So in other words, you really can very convincingly express the core values of your brand if you have your own stores. And that tremendously enhances the scope of the brand's marketing. So much for uh, manufacturers' uh, reaction to the concentration of uh, retailers' power. Manufacturers could also could show their uh, the reaction to the power of distributors. I mean, that reaction is not uh, limited only to the concentration of retailers. It also extends to the area of uh, distribution. Uh, because of the power enjoyed by uh, the distributors and uh, those distributors uh, they're not being very cooperative in terms of uh, the sharing power with the manufacturers. The manufacturers decide to get into their own distribution networks. They create their own companies and those companies basically are initiated in order to support the brand or the brands of that very company. Again, the objective is to uh, control the channel. The objective is not to have power just for the sake of power. The objective is to have a channel which is conflict free in which you can exercise your management techniques and your management prowess in a much more effective way than in a channel which is full of conflict. It is a little difficult at the beginning because it's a new area for the companies to venture into the cost of learning from that point of view is high and um, you make mistakes but once you uh, go a little above the curve meaning the learning curve and you sit comfortably there a point comes when other manufacturers start approaching you for distribution of their brands and the fact of the matter is that that distribution company becomes a very lucrative business in itself something in which was started only because you wanted to bypass an important but difficult member of your channel and wanted to have total control of what you are doing. You are approached by others who really want your help and it is good to grow your business. That is the business opportunity and the fact of the matter is that you really can have that kind of business as part of uh, the growth areas. This kind of a setup is uh, the viable if you are dealing in uh, 
exclusive consumer items. Uh, but this is not to say that uh, you should not uh, the venture into this kind of a setup if you are dealing in consumer consumables uh, which move fast, meaning uh, FMCGs. Uh, there are examples uh, within our market uh, in, in Pakistan uh, where people uh, have gotten into their own distribution uh, of uh, the fast moving consumer goods and they have done very well. No question about that. Uh, having said all that about uh, the reaction of manufacturers to with the concentration of retailers and to the power of distributors, I think you know, what is important is that uh, retailers and distributors they will always remain very important. And uh, even in future years, they will never lose that importance. They will continue to be very important parts and links of the whole supply chain. And uh, it is very important for the manufacturers uh, to have a twin focus uh, both on their customers and consumers. Customers are distributors and uh, the retailers, and consumers are your ultimate consumers. So the trend focus is the lesson, and trend focus is, uh, the, I would say, the conclusion uh, the which uh, the manufacturers uh, must draw. Uh, they, uh, they must be uh, the very uh, sensitive, and uh, they must be very nimble and quick in assessing changes uh, taking place in the market, and then deciding uh, strategic shifts and strategic shifts uh, in terms of uh, the whether to have their own stores or whether to have their own distribution or to have a combination of both or maybe a combination of uh, the so many different factors you know direct distribution indirect distribution and direct and indirect so it is the job of the, the brand managers and uh, the marketing managers and sales managers all put together um, as to how you should move in terms of your strategic decisions. The objective here is to uh, enhance brand power. And uh, once you have the brand power, you have the channel power. And channel power has got to be sustained because it supplements brand power. That is the lesson of the day. Allah Hafiz. And I'm going to talk about a little more about channels in the next lecture and then on to the next topic of communications, inshallah.